Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to what I consider to be the most exciting uh, presentation of the day. And unfortunately, it's the last one, so hopefully you can uh, stay awake through it. Um, today, we're talking about alternatives to sulfur in winemaking, which I think is a, a super exciting topic. We've been dealing with sulfur all of our lives, and we have now some viable op uh, options for replacing sulfur. My name is Arthur O'Connor. I've been making wine all over the world in Chile. Oh, no, I haven't. <laughs> Argentina. Uh, Argentina, Spain, uh, Australia, California. Um, I'm currently involved in winemaking projects in uh, Washington, uh, Lodi, Sonoma, Spain, and doing some consulting. I'm fortunate I get to mentor some winemakers in Paso Robles and Napa. So I get to work all over the place. <clears throat> and again, I say, some of the most exciting uh, winemaking I've seen recently is uh, some of these new products and these uh, new options we're talking about today. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm moderating today, so I'm not actually saying anything of use. Um, the next two people will be the ones giving you the content. I'm just the warm-up act. Uh, so Daniel Dicus is the technical manager for North America Lafort. He's spent over 10 years researching these topics and making wine in this area. <clears throat> and Eglantine, a chauffeur, has similarly spent 10 years making wine and researching these topics. She is the product manager for winemaking solutions for Boucher Vaselin. So to get started, we should just talk for a moment what, what is low sulfur or what is sulfur. <clears throat> um, I think what's important is to talk about the fact that we are not discussing today the consumer's uh, perceptions of sulphur. We're not discussing uh, the health implications of sulphur. We're just talking about what we can use, what, what we can do to substitute sulphur in our winemaking. But just for out of interest, let's have a look at this. This is from a natural winemaking site in France that's highlighting the different levels of sulphur for uh, different products. So conventionals between 150 and 200 parts of sulphur, uh, bios 100 to 150, biodynamic is 70 to 90, and naturals 30 to 40. Um, having made wine in Spain for 10 years, uh, we never really exceeded 100, but either, even so, that's the legal limits. <clears throat> um, not really, uh, don't have a slide here for you for the US, but as you know, uh, contains sulfites needs to go in every bottle of wine that has sulfur over 10 parts per million, which uh, also, as you know, is near impossible to run a ferment with less than 10 parts of ferment, uh, sulfur at the end of it because yeast produce sulfur as a byproduct. So pretty much every wine in, Australia, in the US has um, contained sulfites. Now, I'm going to ask you to humour me for a moment as I am the warm-up act. Um, <clears throat> when I'm looking at winemaking, I want to look at the specific problem, but also look at it over a longer period of time because I think you get to see um, the implications of some of those decisions uh, on a broader scale. So if we just take, for example, uh, this slide. So we go 1969 to 2019 winemaking. And you'll see later why I'm going here. Um, so what we tend to do as winemakers is we'll conduct a trial. We'll trial basket press versus pneumatic press. We'll make a decision and we'll make a change in our winemaking recipe. You, you all with me? So we keep on going through this. Natural yeast to cultured yeast. Natural bacteria, cultured bacteria. Wooden tank, stainless steel, machine harvesting enzymes, uh, delivering lower solids for us, uh, oxidative handling versus anaerobic, uh, high levels of copper due to the machinery, due to the equipment that was being used in the winery at the time, and very little temperature control versus temperature control. <clears throat> what you see here, individually these were good winemaking decisions, but what we tend not to do is take enough time to have a look at the combined effects of these. Look at the winemaking on the right-hand side over here versus the left-hand side. It's a massive change in winemaking that's occurred, and it's really important to look at these things over a longer time period. As an example, when I was in Spain in 2006, I started working as, uh, in charge of... Director of winemaking for Cota New in Spain. It's the oldest wine company in Spain from 1551. 
So I would have expected turning up there that they would be all over here. But strangely enough, they were over here, pretty much every winery. And over a 10 year period, what I did was move them that way. Slowly by doing trials and just going back and re-challenging these decisions that we've made and how we got there. And not, not everywhere, but in Priorat, for example, the oldest winery in Priorat, Scala Day, from, uh, it's from the 16th century, I think. <clears throat> we moved pretty much everything from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, except the copper thing. Uh, we didn't change the valves back to bad, old copper valves. But it's just, uh, I want to set that up for you as I'm, I'm not a person that really likes adding stuff to wine. But today we're talking about adding stuff to wine. But it's for one particular reason, it's to stop adding as much sulphur. Because that's the one thing we haven't figured out how to substitute. So with that and setting that up, I'd like now just to have a look at this. Changes in sulphur use over time. It, 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 bear with me. I arrived here in 1997 from Australia to California to work uh, for Bonnie Doon Vineyards as Director of Viticulture. When I arrived, there was some significant things going on. Trellising uh, was changing from Californian sprawl over to VSP, particularly on the, on the uh, coastal regions, mainly because of the replant for the AXR going on and using devigorating rootstocks. So also seeing high cordons going to low cordons, some really low cordons. So when you take a look at this, wouldn't you expect to see fruit that is less green, less methoxypyrazines, riper tannins? That's what I'd expect to see from that. But it's not really what we've all experienced. <clears throat> and I believe one of the reasons for that is this. We started using more sulphur particularly using sulphur at the crusher. What's that do? It locks in all of our polyphenolics. Why? Because of Brett. When I first arrived here in the late 90s, I heard, came across a thing called molecular sulphur, which I'd never come across in Australia. And everybody was preoccupied with molecular sulphur. To the point that when I came up here to work at Belvedere in the Russian River, they were adding tartaric acid to their red wines to lower the pH so that they would raise the molecular sulfur level. And then prior to bottling, were deacidifying. So the result was some very, very green wines. So the other thing that was going on is cold soak. Cold soak coming in. So cold soak requires sulfur, right, to extract that colour out and lock it in. Alcohols went up consequently. Don't check me on those numbers. They're not verified. That's an opinion. <clears throat> Fundamentally, for red winemaking, in my view, we move from oxidative winemaking to anaerobic red winemaking. We don't do it for Chardonnay. Probably half of the Chardonnays or more are made oxidatively, but for red wine, it seems, we're making it anaerobically. We're locking in all of, all of the polyphenolics day one. Doesn't matter how much oxygen you use during ferment, it's not oxidative. So today, again, let's look at this. Now, we could blame a particular journalist who liked high alcohol wines. We could blame my friend Dave Finney for making The Prisoner, but uh, in defence of Dave, uh, Dave's uh, Prisoner came out, first vintage was 1998, I think, so it didn't hit the market till early 2000s. So we can't blame him either. Um, <clears throat> so, and may I say, I don't want to trash talk Dave and I want to compliment him on being winemaker of the year. And he should have got it 10 years ago. But anyway, that's an aside. So let's, let's dig into this a bit. So what are we trying to do with sulphur, the three actions? We know sulfur has three particular actions, enzymatic inhibitor, antioxidant, and microbial suppression. And I've just put them into three brackets. Microbial suppression of malolactic bacteria such that it will not uh, start malo during primary ferment and conducts and result in stuck ferments, which we've all had and we were having a lot of in the early 90s until we figured it out. 
retinomyces, we've talked about an acetic acid bacteria. What are the three phases? We have harvest, pre-ferment, post-ferment maturation, and pre- and post-bottling. Now, today we're talking about some products that will substitute sulfur in all of these categories. And I think they're pretty exciting. <clears throat> we also are talking about some antioxidants that will work and substitute sulfur there. In terms of enzymatic inhibitor, well, it's only, it's only important if you're doing anaerobic winemaking. If you're making wines aerobically, you need the enzymes to oxidise. So, in my view, we're getting very close to being able to substitute out sulphur. Now, I just came across these things in the last couple of years, and uh, I think it's uh, pretty exciting, and we'll get to see what's next. So, if you leave today, I'd like you to leave with just knowing these three words, which are somewhat new to me, Meshnikoya, Chitosans, and Glutathione. And I will leave it to our speakers who have knowledge of such things. Um, uh, Daniel will be first and then Eglantine. While they're talking, you are welcome to look at these wines in front of you. There are three sets of two trials there. So basically, each trial has a no sulfur sulfur component to it. We will discuss them at the end of Eglantine's speech. But um, I will hand over to Daniel now. How did I do on time? Okay. Okay, you're up. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Daniel. Uh, I'm going to talk about three experiments that we did this year, um, well, two of them at the University of California, um, and what it is that we do at LaFour. Um, mostly what we're trying to do is more research, and we're looking to involve more people in our experiments, uh, both large and small wineries. Uh, so, and going over this talk, if you see something that's really interesting to you, uh, you can reach out to me and uh, via email. My email address is on the last slide, or you can show up at our booth, uh, number 436. Um, there's going to be a lot of info, um, and there's not going to be a test. So, I'm going to go kind of fast on some of this stuff. Uh, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it later. Um, but if you would, just hold your questions until the end. Um, the first experiment that we're going to talk about is a comparison of SO2, uh, standard add of SO2 at 60 ppm versus an addition of non-saccharomyces yeast uh, with no SO2. This was an experiment that we did this year on Cabernet Sauvignon at the Robert Mondavi Institute uh, at Davis. The next experiment that we'll talk about is an interesting application of a mixed culture of non-saccharomyces where we created a blaster. And this blaster is a, um, it's an air gun that shoots yeast approximately 17 feet. It's really cool. And if anyone in here uses a machine harvester, uh, we are looking to work with you. And if you don't use a machine harvester, that's cool too. Um, we have lots of different ways to apply these products. Um, this is just one of them. The last experiment that we'll talk about is an experimental strain of Meshnikoya that we've been developing in France where um, we're using this strain during stabulation. This also happened at the Robert Mondavi Institute. I can talk a little bit more about stabulation if you've not heard of that uh, before. It is a, kind of a, a trendy new process that's happening in uh, rosé winemaking currently. So to start with the ex first experiment, um, we got some Cabernet Sauvignon donated from Elk Grove. Uh, the control had 60 ppm of sulfur and the trial was uh, 50 grams per hectoliter of non-saccharomyces. Now this is a really large add of non-saccharomyces. We typically would say use three to five grams per hectoliter uh, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to see what would happen if we added a whole bunch of it. Um, because you guys probably don't want to add a whole bunch of something that you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So we did that for you, and we're going to share those results. Um, if you guys want to taste it, it's not quite ready. 
but you can contact me. We can do a tasting together. Um, and we're always looking for more research partners. Um, we did analysis using qPCR or scorpions. Uh, I'm sure many of you already know uh, what those kinds of results look like. Um, this was a scorpion of the SO2 edition. So I added 60 ppm on day one of uh, sulfur. And you can see here on the, on the, X, on the X axis, there is, these are the days. So this is day one all the way to day 15. And then this scale on the Y axis is a logarithmic scale. The reason I used a logarithmic scale is so that you can see the entirety of the data. Um, Hansenia spora is coming in at 10 million cells per milliliter. This is highly compromised fruit, which means uh, there was sour rot. We left it in a cold room for three days, and then we ran our initial scorpion. Um, Hansenia spora is not the only character there that's going to be contributing negative aromas and flavors during that pre-fermentative stage. So you can see on day six, Saccharomyces is, is finally coming in uh, and out-competing the other organisms. This is a numbers game. We're, we look at this as, um, if you imagine one cubic centimeter, you can hold a cubic centimeter in your hand, that surface uh, is is a colonizable space. You can fit a microbiological colony onto that surface. It's one cubic centimeter. And if we colonize that surface with our colonies before the colonies can, the, before the uh, colonies related to microbiological spoilage and wine can grow, then we've removed the surface, we've removed the colonizable space prior to the growth of those microorganisms. So that's kind of the premise uh, and what we're doing. You can see the amount of data here is vast. So I'm gonna to try to simplify some things so that you guys can get a better picture of what the ferment looked like. Uh, this again is a 60 ppm add of sulfur on highly compromised fruit. So there are a lot of trends Inside here, you can, you can see on this blue line here, a positive power function is fitted to Saccharomyces. So Saccharomyces has experienced exponential growth. We know this. But there are other trends as well. Decay functions. So Hansenia spora is, uh, is sensitive to alcohol, but it's not so sensitive to sulfur, if you guys know much about Hansenia spora. <clears throat> um, and so there are various functions that you can find different transformations of the data that you can look at. Basically, it's a party. Everybody's there to have a good time. They want to eat, and they want to make ethanol. Um, but it's also diverse. That diversity inside those populations are as diverse as the amount of people in this room. And so what we want to do is we want to help you, in a natural way, capture that diversity and help you express what's in this room. A bunch of really great winemakers who probably love to party, or maybe not, but whatever. So lots of different ways to look at the, the functions here. We'll just keep going along. What I did is I, I transformed the, the, the scale, the y-axis, into a linear scale. So it's no longer logarithmic, uh, but it's the same data. So this is the, the same data that you were just looking at, but you're seeing kind of the top of the data because the baseline is now muddy. Um, because this is a, instead of being a relative axis, it's an absolute axis. So <clears throat> you can see here, Ancinia spora is 10 million cells per milliliter. That's a whole lot. On average, if you don't know, for acetic acid bacteria, about 1,000 cells per milliliter is the average number that, that we're seeing. So if you have less than that, your fruit is pretty clean. If you have more than that, you're above the average. Uh, many of you in this room, winemakers in Napa and Sonoma, you'll be looking at numbers much, much lower than this. 
Uh, some of you may see 100 cells per milliliter of acetic acid bacteria, and you're like, oh my gosh. But let me tell you, out there in other places that should not be named or will not be named, uh, it can be really ugly. Um, so let's keep going. Here you go. Here's the Hansinia spora and Saccharomyces coming in on day six after it's finally grown up enough to uh, begin to produce enough ethanol to cause the Hansinia spora to die. Um, the bad thing is, is that it took six days to do this. So those first six days, Hansinia spora is just pumping out acetic acid and contributing volatile acidity to your final product. Um, <clears throat> and it's doing this because it's resistant to sulfur. Um, but then if we look at our mixed culture that we added, so we had the zero ppm of sulfur and we had the mixed culture of non-saccharomyces, um, Meshnikoya and Torolospora, you can see these, these cultures are far greater than the amount of Hansinia spora. So in the case of no sulfur, we've been able to add a culture that provides downward pressure via competition, just an ecological principle. So utilizing competition, we're able to provide downward pressure for the growth of other microbiological organisms. And the really cool thing is that it works better than sulfur. And I think that's a really powerful statement. Um, it's also more expensive than sulfur, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you guys. 500 grams can cost up to $100. Um, we recommend that you that that you use three to five grams per hectoliter, um, and it is expensive, cost prohibitive maybe in some cases. But if you're looking to do if you're looking to have organic certification. Um, this is a, a really great way to achieve the goals of having a lower sulfur in your wine um, and, and getting through those constraints. When we look at the comparison, the control 60 ppm of sulfur versus the trial, um, you can again see that downward pressure that we're providing via the mixed culture of non-saccharomyces. <clears throat> so let's talk about the results. Um, and in this case, uh, let me give you a little bit of an a little bit more information about what log reduction is. Log reduction is um, <clears throat> at 10 to the three. It's considered sanitation, where you've successfully sanitized your surface. This is according to the FDA. At 10 to the six, you've effectively sterilized your surface. So, in this uh, in this graph, you can see the control has better log reduction than the trial. Um, this graph is on the first, the first scorpion that I ran. So during the first couple of days, sulfur is working pretty good, but then it binds up, doesn't work so well. Um, you can see that, that we actually do better in some organisms than others. So zygosaccharomyces, we had a better reduction. <clears throat> and then in lactobacillus conchii as well, uh, we did a little bit better. Then we look at coming out of the cold soak, Maybe. There we go. Nope. Wrong way. Uh, I missed it a slide. But coming out of cold soak, we get um, we get better results. So you can see um, as the cultures of non saccharomyces are growing during the cold soak and then coming out of it, we get we get a lot we get a lot better results there. Um, okay, so um, here's some conclusions. We did 10 times the normal dose. It does increase some of the sensory character. We've done some preliminary tastings, something that you should all be aware of. These are non-GMO organisms. All of their cellular and metabolic processes are fully intact. That means the identity that's different, the, the identity between you and your neighbor is just as different as the identity between Meshnikoya and Saccharomyces. Um, <clears throat> the um, preliminary tastings show that there is a difference. If you want to taste it with us, you can come by the office. I can show you what it's all about. Um, there is an increase in glycerol production. A lot of people think that the wines taste better, and they certainly smell better, uh, especially during those initial phases of fermentation. 
Uh, the effective dosage rates are three to five grams per hectoliter. And again, the study was performed on compromised fruit. So we're looking to scale some research projects into larger <clears throat> operations. If any of you guys are interested, we'd love to be a part of that. Um, <clears throat> but let's talk a little bit about another process where we developed the uh, living harvester, is what we called it. Um, thanks. And what we did here is <clears throat> we had a winemaker come to us, and she said, my harvester smells like VA. What do I do? So we created a gun. And we put our yeast in it, and we sprayed it all over the place. Um, turns out it works really well. I'll show you some preliminary results. Uh, the vineyard is a vast space full of microbiological life. It's awesome. Um, the harvester is trucking through the vineyard, ripping up berries, and becomes a sugar source, becomes a sugar sink. So it becomes a place where those microbiological organisms can, can live and thrive uh, and turns into a vector. It turns into a vector for microbiological spoilage. So the blaster that we have uh, is currently being manufactured. And if you guys want one, come talk to me. They're really cool. If you guys are interested in a yeast gun, it's not as good as a flamethrower, but it's almost as good as a flamethrower. Um, it's easy to use. We've done a calculated, a five minute protocol. It's safe, non-toxic non-GMO, um, you're not spraying ozone and ruining the gaskets and the rubber material on your harvesters. You don't have someone out there who's having to uh, utilize sulfur. Um, so uh, it's non-toxic. Preliminary data looks pretty promising, and we have a patent that's pending. Here are the preliminary results, uh, 10 to the 4, effectively, on spoilage yeast and spoilage bacteria in our in our preliminary trial. Um, future concepts for this study include the incorporation of more harvesters. Uh, if New Holland is out there, I'd love to talk to you guys a little bit more about it. Um, we need more harvesters. Uh, there's a flushing of the harvester that happens, so the first microbial load is, is, is more than the other, so as the harvester moves through the vineyard, it actually kind of cleans itself just by the nature of it, harvesting grapes. <clears throat> uh, as always, it's an ongoing battle with variation in those field trials. Uh, we're looking to incorporate some cleaning in place. And uh, like I said, we're, we're here to do research. We're here to work with you guys in your process. Uh, we can custom design the experiments with you guys um, and, and uh, get some product into your hand or get you a blaster if you want. The last experiment that I want to talk about um, was an experiment that we did at UC Davis again at the Robert Mondavi Institute. That's one of our students there from Australia. He's really nice. He let me use this picture of him. <clears throat> Stabulation is where you maintain the juice on pressed leaves. Um, and you do that for 14 days uh, at 4 degrees Celsius. And you stir with dry ice pellets or with a goose mixer, some way to stir those, those leaves up, juice leaves. <clears throat> In this case, we did a 36-day ferment on the rosé that's in front of you. The first 14 days, we held it at 4 degrees Celsius. And <clears throat> um, finished our, our fermentation. The control was no mesh nicoya. We did a 25 ppm add of sulfur uh, <clears throat> on both the control and the trial. Um, but we're looking at Meshnikoya and how Meshnikoya can survive in cold environments. Can you utilize Meshnikoya in a cold soak? Can you utilize Meshnikoya in stabulation? Um, what does Meshnikoya do? Um, our strain, uh, which is uh, specific to working in cold environments, uh, is currently under validation. This experiment is not yet complete. So the rosé that you have in front of you uh, is that, is that uh, experiment. You guys are the first guys to taste it. We've just sent our, um, <clears throat> just sent our results or our uh, wines to Sarco in France. So we're going to do uh, thiol analysis 
we're looking at beta glucosidase activity <clears throat> among some other really interesting properties. Um, this graph is not labeled, but <clears throat> the one in blue is native Meshnikoia, and the one in red is our Lafour strain. On day one, I took a scorpion, I quantified the, the, uh, the cells, and then on day 10, I took another scorpion. This was while the, the wine was being, or the juice was being held at four degrees Celsius. <clears throat> and I wanted to see if, if, the, if the strain had cryophilic activity. Um, so we see here, uh, the Lafour strain is, is, a uh, um, overpower or is, is it's a pretty powerful and uh strong strain here <clears throat> uh on the y axis it's logarithmic day 1 and day 10 the low four strain um started at 87,000 where the native strain started at 70 uh and they both grew and you can't really tell by looking at the graph but if you'll notice uh i also uh included the the trend line. If you remember from high school algebra, y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope, uh, standard linear function. <clears throat> Here, it's uh, 135,000. Here, it's 80. If you divide 80 into 135,000, uh, it's like 1,600 or something. 1,600. 1,600 times stronger than the native strain. Uh, so it's doing really well. Unfortunately, we didn't look at biomass. Uh, so one interesting thing to think about is, yeah, the cells are dividing, uh, but what does that really mean? Uh, are we creating biomass? So if you took yourself or the person who's sitting next to you and you divided them into 100,000 different bits, but they were still the same mass, then those results could be kind of counterintuitive. Those results could be, could be flawed. So we're looking at getting biomass so that we know that the, uh, that the result, that the colonies are actually growing and that they're increasing in number, not just in DNA. So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's, that's up next. Like I said, we're still working on these results. Um, there are some, some things that are pending over in France. Uh, but we're using Meshnikoia as a bioprotectant. Uh, you can utilize it during cold soaks. A friend of mine at Washington State University just finished his PhD with Dr. Edwards. I don't know, any cougars out there? Go kooks. Go kooks. Uh, <clears throat> so he just finished his PhD. Jesse Alpin is his name. They found that utilizing Meshnikoia during cold soaks <clears throat> while aerated, reduce the amount of ethanol in the wine by 2 to 3 percent. Mushroom coat is cool, really cool. It's an interesting yeast. Um, there may also be some beta-glucosidase activity, so we're examining that. We're looking at the enzyme, enzymatic potential for aroma revelation. Uh, revelation. We're doing thiol analysis. Um, Lots of really cool stuff is happening at LaFour. Uh, we've got an experiment at every major university inside the U.S., from Virginia Tech to Cal Poly to UC Davis to Fresno State, uh, which I unfortunately did not talk about today. But we got some really good results from, from them as well. So go Bulldogs, go Aggies, go everybody. Um, <clears throat> uh, we want to do more research. We are looking to get more partners. If you have an idea or there's something that you're interested in, contact me and we'll set up a trial. Uh, next year, uh, instead of having 50 partners, we want to have 1,000 partners. We want to have a trial where we include not only UC Davis and the University of Bordeaux, but University of Bordeaux, Davis, AWRI. We want to make the biggest and baddest experiments ever. If you like to do experiments, and you're in this room, probably do, call us, contact me, and we'll set something up. It's been my pleasure. Thank you all.
Thank you. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Eglantine Chauffour. I'm here um, to represent Bucher Vaslan North America and also La Motte Abie, which is a brand, French brand of wine making product. Um, you probably don't know them so much because they are pretty new on the American market, but it's 140 years uh, plus actually that they exist uh, in Europe. So it's pretty new here, but it's not really new around the world. Uh, thank you uh, for um, Win Expo also to organize this presentation on low sulfur winemaking or alternative to sulfur. Very interesting topic, very complex, as you can see today. Um, and we are going to try to cover every single topic uh, possible. So, um, as Arthur said before, sulfur can be used for many different applications. Unfortunately, we don't have the perfect product that will replace sulfur yet, uh, but we do have good alternative for each action. So, we have to use a winemaking product, yes. we. Um, no sulfur winemaking can't be done with nothing. Or it can, but it's very risky. Uh, so let's talk about the alternatives. So the first one, it's, it's a little bit of scaring slides, but don't worry. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about oxidation. So to talk about oxidation, I need to go through to summarize the uh, reactions that are involved through oxidation so we can understand where we can work on. Um, so. Enzymatic or chemical, it usually starts with a phenol that gets oxidized into a quinone, which is this molecule here, that is very unstable and very reactive. This molecule is a dangerous one that will be trapped by glutathione, that is a natural antioxidant present in grapes and wine. Um, that's a good thing. If it gets trapped, we produce a GRP, so grape reaction product, that is a molecule that doesn't move. Then uh, quinone can react with phenolic compounds and produce a phenolic polymerization, which sometimes, if it's controlled and slow, that's positive. That leads to color stabilization, for example. Most of the time, especially in enzymatic uh, reaction, it's very fast and uncontrolled, and it leads to loss of phenolic compounds, loss of color, loss of structure, and basically loss of balance. The last thing that can happen with the quinone is that we can have reactions of oxidation that will oxidize the aromatic compound. Okay, so that's, I summarized enzymatic and chemical. Enzymatic reactions are much faster than chemical reactions. They are all happening with um, oxygen that gets used and activated with um, lacase or polyphenol oxidase, which has the oxidases, oxidases or oxidases dasic um, enzymes on grapes uh, and also in chemical reactions the oxygen gets activated into a radical via redox reactions so pretty complex reactions but basically there is iron and copper that can be involved okay so how can we avoid this or limit these reactions the first thing that is sorry pretty obvious it's to limit oxygen contact yeah so during winemaking process with good uh, cellar practices, but also uh, when we are talking about uh, grapes, as soon as they are picked and the moment of pressing. So we are going to talk about this. The second thing that we can do is to use um, tannins uh, that uh, can uh, inhibit the um, actions of oxy oxidases or enzymes in this case. Then we can... Oula. Sorry. Then we can um, focus the reaction towards uh, the trap of glutathione, so pro protect and um, preserve as much of our own glutathione from the grapes, but also we can enhance the glutathione content of grapes or wine. Then uh, the last part is uh, more for, uh, in this case, I would say white or rosé, but playing with finding agents to remove the precursors of oxidation, which, has, which are phenolic compounds, but also removing any residual copper, iron, and uh, we can scavenge some radicals uh, with tannins. Okay, so it looks a little bit complex, but I'm going to focus a little bit more. So the first step is to limit oxygen um, contact, okay? 
So the way that we can do this, uh, Bücher uh, Vasselin developed a press that is called Inertis. It's a fully enclosed system that will allow you to press grapes without the contact of oxygen. So basically the press is attached to a, a nitrogen reservoir that will basically we use the nitrogen as soon as the membrane deflates. So to displace the volume of the membrane, we are using nitrogen. So there is no contact of oxygen, of air. And then as soon as the membrane inflates, the nitrogen goes back in the reservoir. So we are recycling always the same gas. So we are recycling nitrogen and we are pressing all along the press cycle under uh, inert gas. You can use CO2 if you prefer instead of nitrogen. Usually nitrogen is more used. Um, this has been, I would say, the biggest innovation in terms of uh, press equipment that has been uh, done since 2006. And because of this, there is many uh, research that has been done on this press, on white, on rosé, on red as well. Um, so I'm not going to put you all the results here, but uh, I just wanted to show you one graph where we compare um, Inertis press, which is the one with the nitrogen here, versus a standard uh, classic press. Okay? And we are looking at the phenolic acids, which is the first uh, molecule I told you that can get oxidized, um, where when we press with Inertis, we have much more, not because we extract more, but because we didn't make quinones. So we end up with more phenolic acids. Um, glutathione, if you compare the purple curve here with the red here uh, in, in dash, uh, you can see that glutathione disappears very, very fast in a standard press uh, because there is contact with oxygen all the time and the glutathione is the first natural antioxidant of the grapes, so it gets consumed right away uh, while we preserve everything when we use um, our uh, Bucher inertis. Then the last point that I, we look at is the color. So obviously we produce much more yellow color and brown color when we use a standard press. And you can see this by yourself when you compare, uh, you look at the picture. This is a picture at the end of the press cycle. So you're probably pretty familiar with this type of color. Uh, when we press uh, white at the end of the press, usually we end up pretty brown. Uh, when we do the same grapes, uh, same press cycle, but with a Bucher inertis, we are still very green. Okay, we, we protect all the color. This is the color of the pore mass at the end of the press, uh, and this is the color of the juice. We did many trials. Uh, we have some in US as well with rosé, so if you want samples and if you want to taste them, you're more than welcome to contact me and I can organize a tasting. So the next step uh, I told you is to inhibit the enzymes. So for this, we use uh, the alternative to sulfur for this, which works better than sulfur, in particular for the lacase, is to use sacrificial tannins. So we call them sacrificial or kamikaze tannins, which are tannins that are very strongly reactive with protein and oxygen radical, and they basically sacrifice themselves. They go to react with this protein before your own phenolic compounds do. So you protect your own phenolic compound by using a tannin that is strong, reacts stronger and faster. Um, so Lamotabier did a lot of research on this and developed a protanin R, which is a very uh, strong reactant with proteins, so a very uh, good sacrificial tannin that is also very soft in terms of mouthfeel. But mostly it is instantaneously soluble, so you can spray it on the grapes as soon as possible. That's the idea. Just some results um, here that you can see. We are comparing the wine after malolactic fermentation. We are looking at the color residual. Uh, I don't need to comment so much on this graph. I think it's pretty self-explained. You can see that basically when you use a protein R on grapes at picking, you get much more color after malo. So the difference is pretty important. And you can see it in a visual aspect here. I just want to say that these grapes were contaminated with botrytis. That's why the control is so light in color. Uh, but then as soon as we use protein R uh, at 10 grams per hecto or 20 grams per hecto, you can see that the color improves a lot. Next step is to use glutathione. So using glutathione, how can we reinforce um, or increase the content of glutathione in wine or juice? 
uh, there is only one way, which is to use um, yeast derivates, so nutrients, that are rich in glutathione or cysteine. Sometimes we call it rich in sulfur peptides. That's a different um, language, language to say the same thing, basically. Um, so we, Lamotabie, developed one product that is specifically developed for protecting the aromas, so to be added later towards the fermentation, and it's called Aroma Protect. Um, so you can see here how when we add it, we are actually increasing a lot the amount of glutathione in the wine, which basically, if you remember the reactions of oxidation, we are increasing the protection and the reaction towards trapping the quinone. Sorry, the transitions are kind of weird, but it's... So here are some results about the aromas. So we look at the aromas when we use Aroma Protect versus not using Aroma Protect. We look at the rosé here, five months after alcoholic fermentation, so five months after the addition of Aroma Protect. And we are, uh, you can see that we have much more aromas in the one where we use Aroma Protect. Not because we increase the aromas, but because we limit the, de the decrease of them. Okay, we limit the loss of them. Same here in this graph, you can see the evolution of the aromas. The plain line is Aroma Protect, the dash line is the control. And basically after six months, we can see that the wine with Aroma Protect looked like a wine of one month of aging in terms of uh, amount of aromas. So the next slide, uh, the next topic is to talk about um, microbial uh, management and stabilization. Again, uh, no sulfur or low sulfur winemaking is a very complex and vast topic. So a lot to cover. Um, we saw very well with Daniel already that there is many uh, microbes on grapes and um, different options to control these microbes on grapes and alternative to sulfur or even better than sulfur. Um, what I want to show you here is basically it's very important to control your microbe as soon as possible because if you look at this graph, this is a population of microbes on grapes. And then as we go towards the wine aging and bottle, we are kind of narrowing down the amount of population and the amount of microbes that are able to survive in an uh, alcoholic environment. Not saying it's easier to control them later, it's just it makes sense to start at the beginning so we end up with less microbes to control. Okay? So this was the list, which control are we talk which microbes are we talking about? We are talking about acetic acid bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, which are lactobacillus, pediococcus, anococcus, bretanomyces, a, a big one um, when we don't use sulfur, and other non-saccharomyces, such as zygosaccharomyces, for example, that can be risky if you use concentrate, uh, as an example, uh, towards um, the end of the process, close to bottling. Okay, so um, the first thing, and I'm gonna go very fast on this, uh, is uh, about the Mechnikovia pulcherima, but Daniel already talked about uh, working on uh, non-saccharomyces yeast to use on grapes as soon as possible, even uh, at the harvester, so very, very soon as after you pick the grapes. And basically using uh, non-saccharomyces yeast on grapes will allow you to um, inhibit the development of the other non-saccharomyces and some bacteria, which uh, can replace sulfur in this case, can complement sulfur, but can replace it. So Lamotabie has a product already um, sold in USA, which is called Excellence Bio Nature. You have a trial in front of you, which are the two last wines, where you have one wine that is made with 50 ppm of sulfur. The other one is made with um, no sulfur and the bio nature and the aroma protect that we talked about just before. Um, so yeah, so basically we pre pretty much saw the same result that Daniel uh, presented before. Um, except the one more that we saw is that we realized that using less sulfur, no sulfur on grapes and bio nature allows you to actually add less sulfur later down the road because we are combining less. There is less combining element that has compound that has been produced by the yeast. So that's a very interesting strategy in terms of reducing sulfur since we combine less as well.
Sorry, I'm stuck. Okay. <laughs> I have to, yeah, sorry. That's true. Okay, so when we talk about um, microbial stabilization, we want to talk also about the aging process. And so what I prevention is essential. Preven prevention is essential because um, but you avoid to have contamination and to have to deal with a treatment which involves much heavier um, winemaking product use, but also much heavier loss of, um, so hi higher cost, loss of quality because you are removing other things from your wine and loss of volume. So prevention means good sanitation. Prevention means uh, reduce the amount of nutrients that you can give to the spoilage microbes, which are oxygen. Uh, obviously, uh, some um, nutrients that we use, nitrogen that we use for yeast, but we don't use them uh, towards the end of fermentation. Uh, temperature and pH can be controlled. Check the lees and your topping wine. That's very important. That's the source number one of contamination, the topping wine. Um, and then use antimicrobial agents as early as possible in the process. So as early as possible means on grapes, but also when you finish malolactic, you can actually use some antimicrobial agent as preventive in a consistent way, instead of waiting that the wine is spoiled. So which are your options? Um, basically controlling sulfur and pH, but again, today we are talking about alternative to sulfur, so I'm going to skip this one. Uh, lysozyme. Lysozyme is an antimicrobial agent that is actually an antibacterial agent that works, on, works very good on lactic acid bacteria. So lactobacillus, pediococcus, anococcus. Does nothing on yeast, so does nothing on Brettanomyces. Lysozyme is a protein extracted from egg white, so it is allergenic. It's an allergenic molecule and it's also reacting with color in red and um, requires bantonides on white. Okay, I'm telling you the positive and negative pros and cons of each molecule, uh, but it works very good. The next molecule, which is my favorite molecule in winemaking, it's ketosan or chitosan, uh, however you want to pronounce it. Um, it is a um, finding agent uh, extracted from, processed and extracted from a uh, fungus, which is Aspergillus niger. And it is a finding agent that has a wide spectrum antimicrobial. So it will remove Brettanomyces, that's how it has been developed first, but then it will also remove lactic acid bacteria, some acetic acid bacteria, and some non-saccharomyces such as zygosaccharomyces. So pretty cool molecule that really works on everything. And it is allergen free and vegan. Um, sorbate and DMDC are two other molecules that exist that can be used mainly on yeast and we use them usually toward the end of the process, pre-bottling, when we are bottling uh, sweet wines to avoid the development of uh, saccharomyces or other yeast, bretanomyces as well. And obviously I think in this slide I'm saying that basically the first thing to do is to, ah sorry, yeah it's here. It's, um, it's to remove the cells before you treat the wine if you do have a contamination. So ketosan, a little bit more about ketosan. Ketosan is a wide spectrum antimicrobial agent. It is coming from the deacetylation of ketin, which is um, a polysaccharide that we derive from Aspergillus niger. When I say we, I'm talking about the wine industry. So any winemaking product suppliers will have a ketosan that is coming from Aspergillus niger. Okay, if it's not, it means that it's not legal. Uh, so as you can see, the molecule is like this, and the molecule is charged, positively charged, and that's how it works. Um, ketosan is positively charged at wine pH, and any cell um, cells will have residual uh, negative charge around them. So that's how it works. They get attracted. Okay, so the first phenomen phenomenon that exists is this adherence phenomenon that there is an attraction like a magnet that will attract the cells and then um, will precipitate them because ketosan is not soluble. You can see pictures here how the cells are attracted to ketosan. This is a pretty fast um, action. If you, so this is much 
This picture is much more beautiful, but this one is what you can actually really see when you look at a microscope that you have um, in hand in the winery. And this, in half an hour, you see the ketosan in the middle and the cells coming to get attached to the ketosan. You can see it. And then when you color with blue to see if they are alive or dead, you can see that they all get blue, so they are all dead. Which a little bit dramatic, but it goes to my next point that the second aspect of the um, ketosan action is to actually interrupt the metabolism of the cells to end with a cell lysis and death of the cells. So we are eliminating them, precipitate them, and kill them. Okay? And this we so there is here a result of a study that we are looking at the amount of ATP, which is the energy that the cells are producing, that is released in the environment with different treatment of ketosan. So we look at how much cells are open, basically, and how much of the energy of the cells is outside with different treatment of ketosan or ketosan. And you can see that when we increase the treatment and we wait long enough, which is three hours, it's not very long, we are having an increase of ATP released. So we are really killing the cells. Okay, so if I want to make a little conclusion of ketosan, um, we can use it as a preventive action, so we can use it at very low dosage, after mallow, in a systematic way, so it kills whatever is there. We don't even have to worry how many cells and which one are present, it will remove them. And in this case, when we talk about small dosage, we can leave the ketosan in the wine, and we realize that four months, even four months after, the ketosan is still um, active. So this we realized because we re-inoculate with Bretanomyces some wine that has been uh, treated with ketosan and the ketosan has been left. And we realized that the growth of Bretanomyces was much lower in this wine with ketosan, but also that the volatile phenol produced were much lower. So the ketosan was still interrupting the metabolism of bread. If you do have a contamination, um, it's not um, the end of the world. You can actually treat the wine. So we go at much higher dosage and you will do a fining. So you will really put the ketosan into your wine. You will let it settle and you will rack off this lease because that's how we uh, recommend. But also nobody really wants to leave the wine seat on uh, dead bodies of Bretanomyces. Um, so you can imagine that you, you want to rack it off. Um, La Motabie developed a um, product that is called Kilbret. As you can see, the, the packaging has been pretty uh, well done on this one. Uh, it's, um, so it's a pure ketosan, so we are using pretty low dosage of uh, ketosan of this product uh, when we do the treatment. But also the advantage is you don't have really any organoleptic impact on the wine because we are talking about 2 to 6 grams per hectoliters six being the high dosage. So ketosan is a vegan allergen-free compound that is uh, allowing you to control malolactic fermentation, removes spoilage microbe, prevents spoilage. And when we talk about prevention, we are at very low dosage, such as two gram per hecto. Contamination, we talked about four to six with a racking. So in conclusion, uh, at each step of the winemaking process, you can have different tools, winemaking tools, to replace sulfur and still control microbes, replace, complement, or even better alternative. So we can use non-saccharomyces yeast on grapes. We can also use lysozyme and ketosan on grapes. Um, the main reason would be that, yes, non-saccharomyces yeast are more expensive than sulfur, but if we look at lysozyme or ketosan used on grapes, it's even more. So cost-related, uh, it makes sense to use a non-saccharomyces yeast on grapes. Then, uh, obviously, proper yeast nutrition to not have a stack fermentation. Co-inoculation, promoting co-inoculation is something that helps a lot uh, in terms of microbial control because you don't have this window of no microbes, no protection, warm temperature in between both fermentation. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about this later um, at the booth. And then we can have, uh, obviously, ketosan or um, lysozyme would be the best option for you during aging. So 
just to finish and to open on uh, basically um, what are our options, we are talking about low sulfur. So I thought it would be interesting to look at how we can actually reduce the amount of molecule combining sulfur to increase the efficiency of our sulfur add. So we can, yes, use sulfur alternative where we have options, but then if we do use sulfur, let's try to make it as efficient as possible. And in this case, so we, we just saw that not using sulfur on harvest, but using a non-saccharomyces yeast, um, at least the strength that we have of Mechnikovia pulcherima allowed you to have less combining molecule. Then using a sacrificial tannins can allow you to reduce your dosage of sulfur, limit oxygen contact with the equipment and cellar action, proper yeast rehydration. We saw very good results in terms of lowering the amount of combining molecule when we use rehydration nutrients with the yeast preparation. Co-inoculation will allow you to reduce the amount of acetaldehyde you produce. And obviously, if you can enhance the natural antioxidant protection of the wine with glutathione, uh, it will help you to keep your dosage of sulfur lower. Uh, use a wide spectrum antimicrobial agent, uh, kilbret or ketosan, which will be better than sulfur, also in this case. And we realize also that delaying your sulfur addition after mallow a few days, so using more ketosan or lysozyme and then sulfur will allow you to reduce uh, the amount of combining uh, the rate, the combining rate. So thank you very much. Um, Arthur, it's your turn for the wine. Thank you. Thank you, Eglotin. <laughs> So now um, our time's getting close, so uh, now we just uh, we should taste through the wines and then uh, we'll take some questions if uh, people have very little time. Um, would you like to talk about the first two wines, Daniel? Okay. Uh, so the first two, uh, number one is the, uh, the rosé that we did at Davis with a 30 ppm add of sulfur. Uh, like I said, these wines were stabulated, so they were held uh, with the juice leaves, stirred, uh, twice a day. So you'll have a, a little bit broader mouthfeel on number one and, uh, or excuse me, a little bit broader mouthfeel with, uh, with the stabulation. Um, and then on number two, um, well, you guys should probably taste it for yourselves. I don't know why I'm telling you guys how to taste. Yep. Yep. Uh, so they got SO2 on the vineyard. Um, we thought a lot of that bound up uh, prior to getting to us, but um, it was picked early in the morning on a Monday. It was the 21st of October, and we got about a ton in. It came in at 21.1 bricks. They added uh, actually 25 ppm of sulfur on the vineyard, not 30. Um, we added some enzyme. Um, we adjusted tartaric, added uh, some nutrient, inoculated with Saccharomyces um, after the stabulation, after the first 14 days. We utilized uh, Nutristart Arome and Polymust Rosé uh, for uh, nutrition and uh, color. Moving on to the second, uh, the s second group, wines three and four. I have to thank uh, Artessa Winery for these samples, Anna Diego Draper, who's not here, or Kyle Altamore, who um, made these wines. Uh, they've been playing around with this for a, uh, quite a while using Kato Sands. Uh, and in fact, this is not a trial, as you can tell. The wine on the right has barrel age, and the right wine on the left, wine three, does not. If this is a part of their winemaking practice now. Um, which uh, is fantastic. Um, so, so 25, the first one's 25 parts of sulfur at the crusher, and then it was uh, inoculated with yeast. The second wine, wine four, is a chitosan product from Anatus, um, and they uh, did not inoculate. That was a natural ferment, which is now, as I say, a part of their winemaking. And I think uh, this is not the first time I've seen this this year. I've seen it at a couple of other wineries, a pretty similar result, just getting a very, very soft palate uh, with these wines with no sulfur, uh, which going back to this idea of trying to make uh, 
red wines a little more oxidatively than anaerobically. Um, any questions? Oh, I'll hand over to Eglatine. Thank you. So the, um, the two last wines are uh, Petit Syrah. Uh, that um, one is basic, so both of them got sacrificial tannins, some oak, and uh, it's still at a um, trial uh, stage. We've co-inoculated also both of them, so they are um, alcoholic and mallow done, done now. So the wine number five got 50 ppm of sulfur on the grapes. The wine number six didn't get any sulfur, but got the um, bio nature, so the Machnikovia. Pulcherima, and then aroma protect at the end of uh, both fermentation. And uh, these grapes are organi organically farmed also. Any question? Any favorite? No? <laughs> well, um, I'd just like to wrap, I'd like to wrap up with um, just a comment. This is this year. I've come across uh, these Kaitasan products. I came across the Anatas product at a couple of wineries I was working at. You see one of them here, um, and just was very surprised with the results. These these soft palates uh, on the front, on the back palate, become uh, through low sulphur adds at the front. I also came across um, I think Lafort product using Agide, which uh, did not have a fancy gun. Uh, but was hand sprinkled out in the vineyard on the bins and it worked beautifully uh, as well and just giving these creamy back palettes that were pretty impressive uh, and low VAs uh, through the whole process. So in closing, I'd like to thank uh, Daniel and Eglantine for your uh, help and edification. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank